birth of a nation. I'm about to read a story from 1 Kings 12 because this is part of the story that we need. Here in the midst of a pandemic with inundated hospitals, overworked medical personnel, soaring job losses, escalating tensions, skyrocketing arms sales domestically, corruption in high places. I would like to share with you the story of a biblical nation that fell apart, literally fell apart, but also a nation that was reimagined and recreated. Rehoboam went to Shechem, where all Israel had gathered to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard of this, he returned from Egypt, for he had fled to Egypt to escape from King Solomon. The leaders of Israel summoned him, and Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel went to speak with Rehoboam. Your father was a hard master, they said. Lighten the harsh labor demands and heavy taxes that your father imposed on us. Then we will be your loyal subjects. Rehoboam replied, give me three days to think this over. Then come back for my answer. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam discussed the matter with the older men who had connected with his father, who had counseled his father Solomon. What is your advice, he asked. How should I answer these people? The older counselors replied, if you are willing to be a servant to these people today and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your loyal subjects. But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the older men and instead asked the opinion of the younger men who had grown up with him and were now his advisors. What is your advice, he asked them. How should I answer these people who want me to lighten the burdens imposed by my father? The young men replied, this is what you should tell those complainers who want a lighter burden. My little finger is thicker than your father's, than my father's waist. Yes, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to hear Rehoboam's decision, just as the king had ordered. But Rehoboam spoke harshly to the people, for he rejected the advice of the older counselors and followed the counsel of his younger advisors. He told the people, my father laid, on, laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. So the king paid no attention to the people. So the king paid no attention to the people this turn of events was the will of the Lord, for it fulfilled the Lord's message to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through the prophet Ahijah from Shiloh. This is the kingdom after Rehoboam, really during the reign of Rehoboam. It divided into two nations. The new king in the story that we just read, Rehoboam, had arrived for his inauguration. And were he a wiser man, he could have carved out his place in history as a legend. His reign could have surpassed the glory of his father Solomon and even his grandfather David. But as it turns out, he was not up to the job. He did not learn from the mistakes of his predecessors, his ancestors. In fact, King Rehoboam failed colossally at his very first challenge as king. He had the chance to revive the morale of the people, Israel, but he was not up to the job. 
He had the chance to develop a different kind of empire. This was long before Rome. At this point in history, Rome was a mere outpost, not even a village. In fact, it wasn't even called Rome yet. Had King Rehoboam made sound political decisions, he could have made his nation into a model society, a light to the nations. But tragically, he was not up to the job. It appears that his downfall can be traced to his privilege. He was a third generation monarch and heir to very wealthy regimes. Rehoboam was not like his father, his grandfather David who grew up as a lowly shepherd and was a true country boy who made it big. Rehoboam came up consuming the best foods and wines. He had the best horses and chariots with access to the best education. His friends were among the elites. They included influential religious leaders, military champions, and would, he would also have consorted with royalty from other nations. In fact, his own mother was one of Solomon's many wives procured from the household of a king of another nation. Rehoboam could have used his privilege to make something new of his generation. He could have made his nation truly great, but instead of using his privilege for good, he used it for evil. Even after his seasoned, experienced elders warned him to listen to the people. Oh, what could have been, but what we end up with here is a divided kingdom. Centuries later, even to this present day, we possibly could be celebrating Rehoboam's reign, Celebrating it as a, a time that redirected humanity to a more peaceful and harmonious planet. But he was not up to the job. Long after Rehoboam's time, people would reflect on the days of David and Solomon as the glory days based on a romanticized memory of their period. Most of the nation, the northern tribes, formed a confederacy. Centuries after Rehoboam's death, when people used the term kingdom of God, they were memorializing David and Solomon. Centuries after Rehoboam's time, his people Israel would still be looking for the kingdom to be restored. But those years were not glory days for everybody. The people who did backbreaking and underpaid work had a different assessment of their times. We read of the splendor of Solomon's temple and his other building projects, but we don't read the story of the laborers. We read of how wealthy his kingdom became, but we don't hear about the people who missed out on the extravagance of those times. Centuries after Rehoboam, Jesus would be just one of the rabbis who sought to define the term kingdom of God. But for Jesus, the kingdom of God was not just about restoring their mythical past. In the tradition of the prophets, Jesus had a more complete and inclusive vision. The prophets looked forward to a world where people would love mercy, do justice, and walk humbly with their God. Jesus set out to succeed where Rehoboam failed. Jesus set out to persevere where Rehoboam gave up. Jesus tried to remind his people of the best of their history, but he also wanted them to see where they came up short. Jesus wanted them to see that the past was not nearly as great as the now. When Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand, he wanted his people to capture, yes, the best of their history, but to not stop there, he wanted their ancestry to be a springboard into their own moment in the sun. And in order to enact this vision, Jesus needed to take radical action. Today, the world is crying out for radical action. The world is wounded, but we don't want band-aids. The world is 
hurting, but we don't want more sedatives or painkillers. The world has become uncomely, even grotesque, but we don't want more cosmetic surgery. We need to get to the root of the issues. According to the predecessor of Jesus, John the Baptist, he said, even now, the ax is lying at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. You're looking at a radish here. Now, the reason I picked a radish is because the word radish means root. And associated the same term, radical. Radical comes from root. You can take a, a look at the definitions there. Look at D, designed to move the root of a disease or all diseased and potentially diseased tissue. Because we need to get to the root of things. Some people are comfortable being mere moderates. But to dismantle a domination system, you have to get to the root of it. When you dismantle a domination system, you can build a humane system. Some people are comfortable being moderates, but notice what Martin Luther King said about being moderate. He said, first, I must confess over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I've almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizens council or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more dedicated to order than justice who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods or direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. What I would like to, to share with you in these moments is some of the ways that people are struggling and, 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 and organizing and lobbying and trying hard to bring about change that some people might say is radical, and maybe it is radical if it gets to the root of things, or at least approaches the radical. One of those examples is getting out the vote. Oh, that doesn't sound so radical. Well, it's radical to some people because in my parents' native state of North Carolina, there are churches and organizations still helping people get on buses to go to polling places. I'm not talking about 19, 1960, I'm talking about 2018. These are the ways, the many ways that people are, are trying to enact change. To some people it seems Radical, if you look at radical in, in, in the sense of Jesus, they are radical because Jesus was fully human. He manifested himself in human flesh, thus uniting heaven and earth. You hear people talking about defunding police departments. Maybe controversial to some, but when you look at a city where one third of its budget is dedicated to law enforcement, you know that that's not about serving and protecting poor people. And we see teams changing, discussing the, the name changes of their mascots, the Washington Redskins, uh, the Cleveland Indians, and others. It's not so radical to consider that everybody should have access to health care. 
It's not so radical to enact immigration reform. It's not so radical. Would you just uh, think that way, if not say that to yourself? It's not so radical. Reparations for the descendants of slaves. To some people seems extreme, but it's just human. Environmental protection activism. All of these things may seem radical, but they don't really go to the root. What gets a little closer to the root is education and information. It gets to the root because we are so profoundly miseducated, misinformed, and propagandized. Someone asked me a couple of weeks ago, why do people want to remove the statue of Theodore Roosevelt in front of New York City's Museum of Nat Natural History? Well, it's because we don't know Roosevelt. Some people are just asking, what did Teddy do wrong? But if we know our history, we would recognize that Theodore Roosevelt in his time was the most hated president by African Americans in this country. And the reason he was the most hated is because he was a Republican in the party of Lincoln because it was the party of Lincoln at, the, at that time. And he won the votes, he won the African American vote. But then he quickly, after, after being inaugurated, took on the policies of the racist Southern Democrats. And that statue in New York has on either side of it a diminutive image of a Native American on one side and an African on the other side, thus to establish the appearance of dominance. Education is important and it gets closer to the root. Theodore Roosevelt has a mixed legacy. He was an environmentalist, a progressive social reformer, but he was also an advocate for white nationalism and eugenics. His is not the only legacy that is mixed. Abraham Lincoln ordered the mass execution of 38 Dakota Indians. In fact, Lincoln, when talking about slavery, talking about slavery, he, he, he mentioned, oh, I see, I see you see my oranges, all right? Orange slices. Oh, I love these. This is one of my favorite candies. When, uh, I, I looked for these when I went trick-or-treating. Uh, I love these, but they're, they're not really orange slices. There are things that people use to describe things that they think are good, maybe even taste good and feel good. We use the word democracy when we may not be experiencing democracy, just calling it democracy. Here's what Lincoln said. I think the authors of that notable instrument, speaking of the Declaration of Independence, I think the authors of that notable instrument intended to include all men, but they did not mean to declare all men equal in all respects. They did not mean to say all men were equal in color, size, intellect, moral development, or social capacity. We have to get to the root of things. We get closer to the root when we talk about the founding documents. I'm going to quote Mark Charles, who uh, is the co-author of a book called Unsettling Truths. He is a Native American activist. And here's what he says in his book, Unsettling Truths. While the Declaration of Independence may initially assert that all men are created equal, 30 lines below that assertion, indigenous people are referred to as merciless Indian savages. He also wrote, if we understand white America to be a traumatized people, triggers may be more easily identified. For a nation with a white supremacist declaration of independence, a white supremacist constitution, and a white supremacist Supreme Court, eight years of a black president was a trigger. From 2008 to 2016, 
Many white Americans and white evangelical Christians did not know what to do with the optic of a black man governing from an office that historically had been reserved for white landowning men. It is clear that today we need, we need a new society. Rehoboam watched his empire fragment before his very eyes. A huge percentage of the population decided, Rehoboam, you may be king, but you'll never be our king. Rehoboam could have created a new kind of kingdom. Well, Jesus did establish a radically new kind of kingdom. Rehoboam refused to listen to the people. But the good news today is that Jesus listens to every one of us. Let me remind you today that Jesus hears you. A friend of mine and I had a conversation yesterday, and he was talking about when they were kids, he and his two sisters, they would be out playing. And if one of his sisters or him, one of them got hurt, scraped a knee or something, what they would do is the two of them, two, two, ones who, two, two who were not hurt, would help carry, help, help the other one limp home. And while the sister was on her way home, the injured sister, she'd be sniffling. <laughs> sniffling and soon as they got to the house and walked in the door she let out a loud cry in the presence of her mother that's who jesus is for us we may have been repressing some of our pain some of our hurt but we know that jesus listens to us jesus hears he hears the people who sweep the streets after the parade is over he hears the farm worker. He hears the lonely senior who has no pension. Jesus hears the woman who empties bedpans but does not earn a living wage. Jesus hears the person who never really had a good chance to escape COVID-19. He hears the cashier who gets yelled at for asking customers to wear a mask. He hears the mother who's doing all the heavy lifting. He hears the man on the ground calling for his mother as he slowly dies. He hears the unconvicted inmate. But not only that, he hears the convicted, the guilty inmate. I'm going to finish with an expression of how Jesus envisioned the rebirth of his nation. It shows Jesus' high regard for our collective humanity. But before I read those words, let me remind you again that Jesus did not come to make us into Christians. He came to make us into humans. His goal was not for us to go and announce to everybody we were Christians, but for us to fully manifest who we are. In my neighborhood, I was walking down the street about a quarter mile from my house, and I saw this sign witches for BLM, they have another sign there, Black Lives Matter. And uh, I know someone, I don't know the people who live here, but I know someone who lives across the street. And he told me, I did not witness this, but he told me that after George Floyd was killed, that the young 20-something women that lived in that house each day would come outside with a megaphone and they would announce the names of African Americans who have been killed by law enforcement he said he counted up to around 200 over the days after George Floyd's death that they announced. So how is it that I can find resonance, resonance with witches and sometimes not with Christians? It's a mystery. But Jesus came to establish a different kind of order. And here's how he describes it when he was talking to his disciples. You've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, how quickly a little power goes to their heads. It's not going to be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not to be served and then to give away his life in exchange for the many who are held hostage. 
And my final question today is from Martin Luther King. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists for hate or for love? We need God's blessing. You know, I really appreciate that song, God Bless America. But the word bless can have many connotations, many denotations. Sometimes a blessing, to bless somebody is to approve of them just as they are, to accept them, to, to just let them know you're okay. That's how you bless somebody. But sometimes when I need a blessing, I need change. When I cry out to God for a blessing, many times it means that I don't want what is going on right now to continue. So when we sing that song, God Bless America, we need to know what we are trying to say. So let me share another version that came to my mind. God fix America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God fix America, our home, sweet home. God fix America. My home, sweet home. We humble our hearts before you, O Most High. Because we need your blessing. Our country needs your blessing. Our planet needs your blessing. And we come like wounded children running into the presence of their mother. We come into your presence because we know that you hear us. When it seems like we've been ignored and pushed aside, we know that you will hear us. And so in your presence, all of us who are on this call and those who are witnessing this moment, this profound moment on Facebook, we, we collectively come before you and we ask that you would fix America. That when we sing God bless America, what we are saying is that we believe that America has something to bless, but America has so much to repair. We ask all of this in Jesus' great name. Amen. And amen. I'm going to ask everybody if you would again accept an invitation. If you would accept the invitation to go into a breakout room for just a moment and enjoy your brothers and your sisters. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. Oh, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. Time to sing your song again. 
Whatever may pass and whatever goes before us, let us be singing when the evening comes. Oh, my soul, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name, yeah, 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 I worship your holy name, oh, I worship your holy name, yeah, 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 I'm gonna worship you. I'm going to worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never, never before. Oh, my soul. I worship your holy name. Oh, I worship your holy name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will worship your holy name. Yeah. Oh. Well, welcome back, everybody. Does anybody have any takeaways or add-ons or a prayer? What What's on your heart? God fix America. I think uh, the song that you sang, God Bless America, either that should be our national anthem or America the Beautiful. <laughs> Unless we find out that there's some hidden verses there. <laughs> right? <laughs> It's funny how all the things you had on your tree, they just felt so sort of, well, of course we should want that. It doesn't feel radical, like <laughs> any of those things you had up on your tree. <laughs> that feels very common sense, all of them. Another thing at that root is housing and um, shelter. Yeah. Food, of course, basics are necessary before you can even get to education. Well, yeah, but the reason education is at the root is because the reason we tolerate so much inhumanity is because we are propagandized, we are misinformed. Well, I don't want to remove that. I mean, I just think that below that, yeah. a little closer down to the bottom is in the basics that are needed before they, you can even... Right. And, and so what I'm saying is that all of those things, including access to health care, all of these things, if we were rooted in our humanity, all of these things would be taken care of. But we have been propagandized against people. Honey, you should bring that up, Nancy, because um, that I forget the name of the act that um, put a moratorium on rent and mortgages. That's up at the end of this month. So it's going to be, it's going to get really tough for a lot of people. Even, even if something good was implemented, 
just the stress that people are living with right now in the uncertainty is is not a healthy thing. Yeah, it's frightening. I agree that it's getting worse and and um, we're not taking this seriously enough. Yeah. Yeah. In in everything. And I think it's just a time I think this you know, one of your first lessons is that um, it's it's just all coming in in this perfect storm and that this is the time to change to make those radical changes yeah i had someone tell me that they were afraid that the blacks were going to have a new song other than um you know what we see now and, and that's uh, uh, they were concerned that they were that you're just going to take over everything and it's like so <laughs> <laughs> right so so see, i don't have a problem with women being in charge i'm not threatened by that like oh well what will i do well i'll support the women <laughs> well you support the right that's right yeah i would support a woman that was wrong i think in, in my opinion wrong in, in in her hate let's say and you see, the thing is that um, what you just expressed, Nancy, of some of the comments that people have made is um, so trippy to me because, you know, the, that whole issue of, of um, um, power and, 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 and intentionally, you know, excluding um, is, is that's not even part of like, you know, the, the life force of, you know, the black community or people of color communities, even with everything that has been done historically, you know, that, that, that hatred or exclusion or dominance is not even like, a, a, you know, a, a dominant feature of, you know, like who like who not, we are, you know? Yeah, exactly, you know? And so that's, that's, that's you know, Hasmina saying that's in the white imagination. Um, but I was going to say, you know, you know, what really bothers me is knowing all of the millionaire and billionaire people that absorbed all of the monies that were supposed to go to help, you know, the mom and pop stores, the the, the working class individuals, you know, peoples that um, it, it just literally got usurped, you know, by these greedy mofos, you know, these greedy mofos yeah. that, that had no business, you know, uh, uh, contesting and applying to get those monies. And it's unfortunate because you're, you're saying about, you know, what's to come and it, it, it's going to be beyond devastating and my prayer every day is that God equip us to be able to um, love each other you know and 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 help each other through the the times as they get more and more difficult so many people are going to be ousted from yeah. their homes and, and so many have already you know because uh these landlords, these owners, these corporations that own masses and masses of apartments and housing and so on, they've already kicked a lot of people out. You know, we, we, we're, not, we're not hearing all of that, but that is what's taking place and it's just gonna get that much worse. So th there's, another, uh, there's another case of why I'm emphasizing that we got to get to the root of things. And I said we were getting close to the root if we would examine, honestly examine our founding documents and how it opened the door for a system of domination. If we would go to that, we, that those aren't the roots. Those are closer to the roots though. And if we deal with that, then we will be dealing with everything else. We, we, because in there is a separation of some humans from other humans in terms of merit and worth. And, and that's close to the root, but next week I wanna, I wanna, get, I wanna even get closer to the root. Um, all right, is everybody ready for communion?
If you have uh, some prune juice and some rye crisp or any other alternative uh, bread and cup. You know, I feel like we could talk about this for about two days. Um, and, and so let's do whatever we can to keep the conversation going. Can I, can I say one other thing? Or is it too late? Go ahead. I was just, um, you know, I've been talking to my more conservative, you know, we have some very conservative family members and trying to use like the examples of like redlining or, or what I've learned about like the school system in La Colonia and, you know, trying to explain like how, you know, trying to explain like this, this might be a reason why things aren't great. And it is so hard to get people to understand something they haven't experienced firsthand or that doesn't affect them. I don't know. A.K. Uh, uh, that's just a, a thought I had. They are tragically misinformed. We're all tragically underinformed. You know, we've been conditioned uh, to think of uh, the orange slices that are candy rather than the actual orange slices, if you will. And uh, we've got to get to the root of it. Trying. <laughs>